how much of this dynamic of cratering battery prices because mm -hmm. of less demand uh, and way more supply plus breakthroughs in the dry battery cathode process, a battery process that's going to dramatically lower the cost in the long term where mm -hmm. Tesla has had a breakthrough. How much of that is influencing Tesla's decision to move up their affordable car using their existing lines because the biggest percentage mm -hmm. of costs of the car has now plummeted. I don't th I don't think the the battery prices influence that. I think we had uh, battery cells that were cheap enough this year or the year before in order to do that. The what what, what interested me in talking about the affordable car was I think people are underhyping it. I think because Tesla said that we don't expect this to use a full unboxed process that people think this is going to be a a more uh, a a much more expensive vehicle than they initially thought was like a, which was like a $25,000 vehicle. I don't, Tesla could make like a modified version of the model three or the model Y, but I don't see that driving costs down enough for them to get another incremental million units per year. I think they have to reduce, uh, produce a relatively cheap car in order to be able to sell another million vehicles per year. So how cheap, can we expect that affordable vehicle to be? And this is this is where my thinking was. At Investor Day, Tesla said they wanted to reduce the cost of a vehicle by 50%, cut it in half. But only 13.5% or thereabouts, 13 or 14% of that, if you count the pickles, pixels in the bar chart, uh, was due to the unboxed process. So let's say you're getting 36% of that 50% cost reduction just by reducing the size of the vehicle, making the powertrain smaller. Let's call that 33% less, a third less cost. So if Tesla's cost of goods sold right now is $36,000 and you reduce that by a third, you're looking at a $24,000 production cost for that vehicle. And you just add some of the benefits of the unboxed process, not the full 13.5%, and take into account that 36% or $36,000 cost of goods sold is for all vehicles, even the more expensive ones. I think we're going to be seeing Tesla producing a vehicle that's maybe a $22,000 or a $23,000 cost of goods sold. Add $5,000 to that, for example. And I think we're looking at a, um, an affordable vehicle in the range of like twenty-seven dollars to $28,000. And they're going to be producing that in factories that are already in place with established supply chains with veteran employees. So I think it's going to ramp fast and it's going to be cheap. And I think it's going to hit a lot uh, harder and have more of an impact than people think. Are you, I mean, it sounds to me like you're assuming that these interim vehicles are going to be smaller vehicles than anything that we offer currently? Yeah, that's, well, I think at least one of them is going to be. If we want to hit those, as I said, if you want to produce another million vehicles per year out of those same factory and sell those vehicles, I think you're, you, you can't just cut the cost by two or $3,000, which is, you know, I think that's about all the cost you can take out of the Model 3 or the Model Y. I think you actually need to produce uh, a very different vehicle rather than just a modification of what they exist they already produce and do you think that they are going to employ both front and rear giga castings because that's one of the things that you know honestly surprised me a little bit with the highland model 3 is that we're still using the entire you know body in white is a stamped and welded frame. Well, it depends on which factory they're going to the pull these out of. And it, it makes sense to me that they're still using like a stamped and welded body in white, because I kind of look at uh, vehicle manufacturing lines as money printers. And if there's no reason to shut that line down, then uh, you shouldn't do it. Because if you change from a body in white to a giga casting, that's going to require a significant amount of downtime. Are you going to recoup that through uh, adding giga castings? It might be worth it if you plan on uh, implementing new vehicles on that line and to give yourself some flexibility because the, uh, those giga casting machines, you can swap out the head on those things within, you know, I think it's within a few hours. You can just swap out the, uh, the head the on dies. It so you can, yeah. Yeah, the dies so you can, um, produce different vehicles. So yeah, the, the cost it, benefit wasn't there in the past 
to swap over, but now there might be. It's interesting. I've been thinking about this a little bit and just trying to wrap my head around it because it, it seems like maybe there's two independent axes that you have, you know, boxed versus unboxed production. But, you know, you can produce larger, the same size or smaller vehicles with unboxed production. And then there's, okay, hey, we're going to build these mostly on current existing lines. Well, that also um, could be larger, the same size or smaller. But then the the other axis is, hey, you know, is that size larger, the same size or smaller? And so, like, in my mind, we could be going ahead and going down to that compact vehicle with these interim next, you know, middle of the road uh, produced on the same lines vehicle. And if that were the case, I would expect them to be, um, I guess really either way, I would expect any new vehicles probably to to utilize castings because I wouldn't think that you would want to reconfigure the stamping and welding uh, shop to do a new frame that is different than the the Model 3 and the Model Y in Fremont. And I think, in fact, even in Austin, the the front end of both the 3 and Y are also stamped and welded. They don't use a, a front giga casting, or at least they didn't last I knew. Yeah, I would think for new, you would expect you would expect those to be castings, correct? I would expect them to be, and it's not for the reason that you would... Uh, here's my thinking on that. Those stamping lines and welding, that takes up a huge portion of the factory. If you swapped out those stamping lines for a giga press, you open up more production space for vehicles. So that to me, that would be the biggest argument. It's not that the giga cast, the giga casting is better, but um, the main reason I would want to do that at Fremont was to free up, free up that floor space so you can produce uh, an entirely new vehicle. And then I think it's important to note that focusing on the giga casting is a good point because the unbox process it's just something that sort of emerges from a lot of other technologies that tesla's implementing so you have the wiring the giga castings the structural battery pack you can implement all these other technologies and not do an unboxed process you can do all these other things and uh, save money on the production of the vehicle but you don't necessarily have to do it with a parallel manufacturing process so that's what, what I think they mean when they're using parts of the unboxed process. I think that they mean the, the underlying technologies that make the unboxed process possible. All of this is an interesting discussion because there was a highlight from Omid Afshar, who's one of the executives at Tesla, that after the second quarter update for 2024 earnings update came through, there was a highlight of the earnings that talks directly to your sort of assumption or what you think is an under hyping of what's about to come. And uh, a Tesla executive uh, highlighting this maybe is sort of like, hey, maybe y'all should be paying attention. And so just to sort of read this for the crowd, uh, plans for new vehicles, including more affordable models, remain on track for start of production in the first half of 2025. This is after he said, important highlight from our Q2 2024 update. These vehicles will utilize aspects of the next generation platform as well as aspects of our current platforms and will be able to produce be produced on the same manufacturing lines as our current vehicle lineup. This approach will result in achieving less cost reduction than previously expected, sort of talking about your, hey, instead of 50%, it might be 33% or 35%, uh, but enables us to prudently grow our vehicle volumes in a more capex efficient manner during uncertain times. This should help us fully utilize our current expected maximum capacity of close to 3 million vehicles, which if you look at uh, 2023 sales of 1.8 million, it would add at least another million, million to sales per year. Uh, enabling more than 50% growth over 2023 production before investing in new manufacturing lines, which implies, right, if I'm reading this, if I think I'm reading this correctly, that this is not the only time that they're going to combine unbox and not box and not unbox, like regular or unbox. Like they might be using this line in multiple ways. And then on top of that, our purpose built robo taxi product will continue to pursue a revolutionary unbox manufacturing strategy, right? And so I, it's just, it was fascinating seeing uh, Omid highlight this after Elon specifically said on the call, well, we don't want to Osborne ourselves. And then Omid's like, check this out. <laughs> Let's Osborne, right? So it, it's just, it's fascinating. Go ahead, Hans. So, see, so you want to add something? Well, I, I was going to say, so this is the place where I, 
I think that we've been talking about this compact next generation vehicle for so long that for most of the community, we're still kind of stuck in the thought process of this next set of vehicles being compact. But, you know, growing from 2 million capacity to 3 million capacity is not that much. Like, I'm expecting compact platform to be way bigger than an incremental 1 million units. So it has me asking the question, are we talking instead of a smaller car about potentially a Model Y XL that's more along the lines of like a Toyota Highlander in size instead of a Toyota RAV4 in size or some other variations on maybe expanding current platforms or, you know, filling in the space between an X and a Y, or even maybe expanding the X, which, you know, is a decent size SUV, but it doesn't fill that full size, you know, eight seat, potentially SUV. Like there's, there's other holes in the product lineup besides that compact vehicle, where I think there is volume to be acquired that's not all the way down there at that compact size where I do think that, but but then the question is, okay, does that make sense with cost reduction? And you know, maybe you do have a lot of cost reduction that you can get through the implementation of you know, steer by wire and doing the ether loop instead of having the old CAN bus and, um, and implementing castings and all these things. So I don't know, it's, I'm just really trying to leave these different possibilities open in my mind as we, you know, come into 1010. The way I think about that statement is when they say including m more affordable models, right? It implies more affordable than now. And so my thought process is like, okay, so it goes down from a $35,000 starting price before tax credits or whatever that number is to maybe 30,000 or 28,000, like Jordan was saying, right? And if we're thinking about, hey, our existing line will be fully utilized before new lines and it will get us 50% growth. It doesn't really mean that they're going to stop there. If, I, the way I read it is like, hey, we're going to hit a million and then we'll build more for 2 million, 3 million, 4 million, 5 million. And then robot, this robo taxi thing, whatever this is, will be on its own thing, which is going to be unboxed. And that one's going to be 20 million a year. I don't freaking know. <laughs> I mean, that's a crazy number, right? But but it's it's they're sort of pursuing a, a whole different thing because, you know, when you think about self-driving vehicles, we've talked about this many times on the channel, it just rewrites and re you have to view transportation through a completely different lens. Everything changes. The cabin safety implications how you know the ratio of your hood to your cabin your hood to your uh to your uh your trunk space right just the whole proportions of the car just completely out the window and then the you know in, in a driverless future how much of the existing line can you truly use in uh in in a in a driverless car because those lines are optimized to have a cabin and that that is purpose built for steering wheel pedal and all the mechanisms that are tied to that, right? So um, that's how I read that statement. But you could also be correct because, you know, the van has been something, you know, if, if we look at sort of the vehicles that they were hyping, the van was something. The one slide that they had had two compact cars with uh, with um, covers on them. Uh, I think I think you're right. But they had they had two they had two compact cars and, a, and like a van shaped one that were undercover. So are this are those the three things they're going to unveil on 1010, which used to be 88, you know, the the robo taxi, the cheaper compact car. And then the way they're talking about it was like, hey, by the first half of 2025, we'll have production going, which means June. But if it's like but if it's a model Y timeline, because here, here's another very interesting thing, right? The last time Tesla uh, unveiled and released a car that was based on an existing line, so Model Y, they were six months early. People forget that. When the Model Y was first announced and then launched, it was it came out six months ahead of schedule. And part of me thinks is like, this is just me throwing ideas out there, is that how much of that was a purpose, like how much of that was them deliberately trying to throw people off so that they don't Osborne. But like, hey, this thing's coming six months later. And then all of a sudden they're like, yo, check this out. It's actually much earlier than you thought. You can buy it now. And something like a cheaper vehicle, 
you know, one, one of the things that I've thrown around is like, hey, it's in your best interest to like delay the announcement of this thing as much as possible and get it as close as you can to the actual delivery date of the vehicles, because that gap is going to create such a massive wait time for people that it's going to seriously hurt not only your current sales, but it's also going to piss off a lot of people that have to wait maybe longer than they should to buy what's likely to be their most expensive purchase in their lives that happens to be the most affordable car for from Tesla, which also will have the largest amount of demand. So it's like, it makes a lot of sense to delay that. So I wonder how much of that is like, hey, this is first half of, of 2025, but really it's January, not, or February, it's not really June. And then if you announce it on 1010, that's only a two month wait, which is not terrible, right? I don't know, that, this is just what's going through my mind. I don't know if any of this is right or not, but it's just, it's just, it's sort of similar to the FSC discussion where it doesn't feel real that we're actually getting to a point where these things are coming to fruition that we've talked about for so long and now it might actually happen.